Brad. Um, I, I hope that everybody is ready for Thanksgiving. You ready? I have ordered my bone jangles turkey. Right? It is going to be ready Wednesday morning. We will warm that sucker up on Thursday, and it will be very spicy and very good. Um, I am, I, I just, uh, this is just an opinion, so don't send me any type of anything, but um, I just think turkey is kind of bland, and it, you know, I put a lot of salt and pepper on it, and I just figure if you're going to be that unhealthy, just go ahead and get the Bojangles turkey and be done with it grease and the whole nine yards and the fat and stuff and just have a good time, right? Right? So, so that, that's what we're doing. I ran across this this week on the internet. It's this, that hand, of course. Um, forget world peace. Visualize you using your return signal. Just a public service announcement for you. Um, I am a fan of the Peanuts. How many of you like the Peanuts comic strip, right? Um, he ran from 1950 all the way to 2000. Charles Schultz died of cancer in 2000. Actually, the very day that he ran his last comic strip. Um, I have the last comic strip that came out in the paper and, well, the, the Sunday paper. I have the last one. And then I have the last actual strip, the comic strip that he ran. And it's... Um, framed on my wall in my house. I know that's not surprising, but I do, I do have that. And one of the reasons, oh, this is nice. Seth, this is nice. Now, I, now I'm kind of casual, right? Um, the reason I like the Peanuts is because all of those characters, as awkward as they are sometimes, are all the characters that you know in life, right? You, you meet them, they're real, it, it's got a graininess to it, and it's, and it's funny. They're not all funny, but the, most of them are funny. I, I just get, get a kick out of that. So you, you're kind of reminded that, yeah, you're odd, but so is everybody else, and these people are actually normal, though they're odd. It's just a nice little thing, and I just like, I like the peanuts. I like, I like to watch them. So a couple of things about it. This is, of course, Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown always was trying to get the affection of the little red-headed girl. Now, with the exception of the movie, which they never really get together, she just at the end of it, you know, becomes his pen pal or whatever. And another little thing where he danced with her but doesn't remember anything about the evening. You'd have to watch all that. He was always reaching for the little red-headed girl, but he never had the confidence to go and, and talk to her. And he, she was always out of his reach to get her affection back. Okay? That was the storyline. The next character is this one. This is Snoopy. Now, Snoopy is the coolest character of all the Peanuts. If you wanted to be anybody, you'd want to be Snoopy because he is, he's just cool and funny and, and he doesn't have a job and he lives off of the government. So, um, which would be Charlie Brown. So, he was always trying to get the Red Baron. Always. Always trying to shoot him down but never was able to. In fact, the Red Baron shot him down all the time. It, it always ended in that way. So the Red Baron was out of reach for Snoopy. Next. <laughs> Here's Linus. Linus always wanted people to believe in the Great Pumpkin. He would go door to door, house to house, trying to do it. Doors slammed in his face and all that kind of, kind of stuff like that. Nobody would ever believe him except for Sally one time. She believed that it would happen, but then at the very end of it, she, she left the cause as well. So he, it was always out of reach for him to promote something that wasn't real, though he thought it was real. Next. Sally. Sally always called Linus her sweet baboo. And he would always respond saying, I am not your sweet baboo. So during the whole comic strip, Sally is reaching out for Linus's affection, and Linus never gives it back to her. Never gives it back to her. And so he, she reaches for something she cannot obtain. Here's another one. This is Lucy. Lucy is always reaching for the affection of Schroeder. Never can get it. In fact, Schroeder does not like Lucy, though he always allows her in, her house, in his house. I don't understand that. But nonetheless, she can never get the affection of Schroeder. Next. Now, this little kid right here is called Rerun, and you might not be familiar with Rerun as much as the other characters, but Rerun is Linus's 
brother, also Lucy's brother. In the comic strip, when he came on, he always wanted a dog. Well, his mom and dad would never let him have a dog. So he tried to go through different things to try to get a dog, and it never worked out. He always reached for having a, got, a, a dog, but could never really obtain that. He could never get what he wanted. Next. This is Peppermint Patty, which is my second favorite of all the Peanuts characters. She is absolutely incredible. And Marcy. And you can't, have, you can't have Peppermint Patty without Marcy. Now, what you may or may not know is Marcy and Peppermint Patty in the comic strip are, are always trying to get the affection of Charlie Brown. If they go to camp, they want to know which one he missed more than the other. They're always vying for that. But Charlie Brown is always out of their reach. He's just not interested. In fact, if they call him on the phone, sometimes he says, I think you have the wrong number, and then he hangs up on them, right? So they can never quite get that. Another thing about Peppermint Patty is she can never get anything above a D- in school. She tries and tries and tries to get a better grade, but she's always getting a D minus. She wants an A, but she's always getting a D minus. In fact, in some of the strips, the comic strips, she is, she is talking to um, Marcy and she says, okay, I just did that homework assignment. And then Marcy will say, well, that was due two months ago. So she's always trying to get the A, but she can never really attain the A. In short, they're reaching for something that they can't get. They want it, but they can't get it. It's out of reach. So with that in mind, I want you to turn in your Bible to Luke. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. Verse 43 is what we'll be reading. And I'm actually going to start, because um, the paragraph in the original actually starts a little bit before 43, so you'll catch up when I get to 43. And it says this. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. And immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowd surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, someone touched me, for I perceive that the power had gone out from me. I need about four guys, four girls, just to come on stage real quick. Just jump up and come up. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to call you. Just come on up. Right. That's one. It's two, three. Great. Anybody else? Yeah, great. Awesome. It could be older. It can be older. It's anybody. It's anybody, really. It is. Come on. I really need a bigger crowd. Yeah, come on. Come on. It's good. It's all good. Okay? So, we're going to let the guy with the beard be Jesus. Okay? And girls, I would like you to stand on this side, okay, of, of Jesus. But you're going to have to get kind of not too close to him, but y'all can get close together. So y'all can... And you get close to him, okay? So, um, if you'll stand, if you'll come here, and you'll be right here, and uh, you just be in front of Jesus, okay? I don't have anybody behind, but you're going to use your imagination, because it didn't have, yeah, okay. So, I, figuratively, not literally, am the woman. Okay? Figuratively, only figuratively. So, Jesus is walking along, and there is a huge crowd. And this woman, she has an issue of blood, and she has reached out for a cure her entire life. She has gone to every single physician, she has done every single type of cure. 
She has laid awake at night praying to God for him to take it away from her. She has struggled with this issue and she needs a solution. She has reached out. 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 And she's about out of strength to reach out. Somehow or another, she figures out that Jesus is going to be in town. And she's not really sure who he is, but she knows that he has healed people. And there's a great crowd of people. And so she begins to try to get in to where she can get at least to Jesus. She's unable to do that. She's unable to get in the way of the crowd as he moves to get his attention to have a conversation because she's heard about these people having conversations and then they get healed and she just wants to have that conversation. She's not able to do that. She, she is trying to get in. She's trying to get to him. She's trying to get his attention, but she just can't do it. And so what she does in a last ditch effort to get to him is she thinks if I just touch him, maybe that will do the trick. So what she does is she comes up and she gets down and she gets to him and she finally gets to touch him for just a moment and then this person goes the other way and just for a moment she touches the Savior and she feels something happen. All of a sudden what was out of reach was in reach. All of a sudden because of her faith and because of her determination to get to the Savior, her last chance to get healed, she makes it, feels it, and is healed. Jesus knows it. Peter <laughs> says, Dude, we are all up against each other. Do you know how many people are here? He goes, Jesus, look around, dude. Look at all. Have you missed? Everybody's. I've been touched everywhere today. And all these people up against. What, what do you mean somebody touched me? And Jesus says, no. I felt power go out of me. And so what that does is it stops the crowd. And all of a sudden, the crowd parts. And the woman is now going to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Jesus. Let's give these people a hand. So, she came up behind and she touched him, the fringe of his garment. That means she barely made it. And immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, who was it that touched me? And when all denied it. Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and are pressing on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceived that power has gone out for me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, because they had stopped, and she knew he knew, and she knew that he knew that she knew, she came trembling and falling down before him and declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. I'm extremely thankful for this story. I am thankful that we have a God that heals. I'm thankful that we serve a God that is powerful enough to heal your disease, that is powerful enough to heal your cancer, that is powerful enough to take your pain away from you. I am thankful we serve a God that heals. Now the point of this particular part of the sermon is not this. It's not that if you just reach out to God, God's going to heal you because to be honest with you, God doesn't always heal people that reach out to him. But I am thankful that he does heal people that reach out to him. See, there were more people in that crowd that had issues, but it's this lady that got healed and other people did not. It could be because they didn't go in to reach. It, it could be for various reasons. It could just be because God, Jesus just didn't 
want to, need to, or whatever at that particular point, but this person reached out and she was healed. I am thankful that we serve a God that heals. I want you to know that he doesn't always choose to heal, but if you're one of the people that you've prayed for God to take something from you and he has touched your body and he has healed you, you need to be thankful today because that is a huge blessing that some people reach out for and they don't get it but you were able to for some reason. And I will back up here to say this as well. If God did something like that for you, he did it because he still has a plan for you and it has to do with whatever he did for you and that story that you tell other people. Amen? So I'm thankful. (laughs) I am thankful this morning that we serve a God who can heal if he wills. I am thankful to serve a God that we can trust to always do the right thing. He always does the right thing. If he doesn't answer that prayer, it is still the right thing. If he answers that prayer, it's always the right thing. I am thankful today that we serve a God that gives strength and comfort during tough times. That he comes alongside of you. And he gives you the strength and the comfort that you need to make it through whatever you're going through. I am thankful we have a God like that. I am thankful that I am able to reach out to a God who's all-powerful. I'm thankful for that. I don't know if you know anything about any other types of religion, but, but other false gods out there do not have that. You have to earn it. They have to like you. You have to be in the in group. You've had to do everything that they, they told you that they're supposed to, that you're supposed to do, and you're supposed to do that. And so you kind of have to earn their power. You have to earn their protection. God doesn't make you earn it. He is there for you to reach out to. I don't know why he chooses for some people to be healed and for others not to be healed, but I know that there's a plan and I'm thankful that we can trust him with that plan. Amen? Very thankful. Um, That said, here's another thing I ran across on the internet this week. These are two dogs and this is what they're saying. Look, when the family comes over for Thanksgiving, it is literally going to be raining food. People drop things, peas roll off of plates, gravy drips, things happen. So stay alert. So with that in mind, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. We'll begin reading with verse 24. You, you know what? This... What is going... That's... I've got to, I don't know what's going on. Let me, let me, let me see something. Okay, I'm just going to tell you a story. (laughs) That is not the right scripture. I think the next one is. Anyway, there's this woman that had a daughter, and and this is a true story, though I'm telling it this way. There's a woman that had a daughter, and she was demon-possessed, and she was really, really worried about her. To the point that she... She, she was very emotional about it. She had also tried to get help for her daughter. Now, every mom in this room understands what this woman is feeling. We're not there yet. Every mom in this room understands what she's feeling. I know that when my kids had the 104, 105 temperature, my wife did not sleep until that temperature came down. 
I know that there were all kinds of prayers going up because I was concerned, my wife was concerned. I've never had a, a child that was demon-possessed, although sometimes I wondered. I'm not just kidding. I never have. I have two good kids. It's just a joke. But this woman, she needed help, and she went to Jesus to ask him for help, and she said, please heal my daughter. And Jesus said, I did not come to do that for you. I did not come for the dogs. I came for the chosen ones of Israel. So basically, Jesus called her a dog. Because he's not politically correct. And in scripture, if you're really technical about choosing, God has chosen one race, and that is the Jewish race. And through the cross of Calvary, he has also chosen Gentiles to be a part of that family. But the first race that he chose was Jews, and there's a reason for that that we're not going to go into in this message, but he chose them. So what he's telling her is, I didn't choose your type of person. I didn't choose your demographic. I didn't choose your social standing. I didn't come here for you. I came here for the people of Israel. And this lady says to Jesus, she says, even the dogs eat scraps off of the table. And Jesus turned to her and said, you have great faith and your daughter is healed. That's an amazing story. Here's a woman that is being told no by God, but she persists with God for a healing. She continues to reach out even when she thinks he is not going to heal her. He is, uh, he's not going to heal her daughter. He is not going to do her request. She continues to go on and say, but this is true, but this is true, but this is true. Please help me. Please help me. Great. Mark 7, 28. Awesome. She tells him that, right? She keeps reaching out. She keeps reaching out. I do want you to turn to Mark 7, 28. Mark chapter 7, verse 28. I do want you to turn there. Now, is it? 24. Yeah, it is. Right. So I want you to hear the words of the Lord and, and then we're going to continue. It says this. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon and he entered a house and did not want anyone to know yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile. A Syrophoenician by birth. And she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to make the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, yes, Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, this statement, you may go your way, the demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in the bed and the demons gone. I am thankful today that we serve a God that will even give us the crumbs off the table. Because a crumb off of God's table is more powerful than anything you can do. I'm thankful for a God that's honest with who I am and who he is. I'm thankful for a God that will call what it is what it is and not worry about if it's right culturally or not, but he will just call it what it is and be done with it. I am thankful to serve that sort of God. Now with that in mind, turn, in, turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Great. This is wonderful. This is the right passage. Yay. Yes. Now this is a parable, but I want you to listen to it closely. Listen. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen who feasted 
sumptuously every day. Love that word. And at his gate laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. I want you to notice, he desired to be fed just what fell from his table. I'll eat what the dogs eat. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side, and the rich man also died that was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and Lazarus and light men are bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all of this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here, you may not be able. And none may cross from there to us, none at all. There is coming a day where a certain amount of people that had the opportunity to reach for God would no longer be able to reach for God. You see, you and I had a great divide between us and God, a great chasm, if you will. It was huge. It was because of our sin. And to be honest with you, next screen, you and I, we were not going to reach out to God at all. But God, in his sovereign will, decided to reach out to us first. I am thankful today that God decided to reach out to us first, to bridge a gap between us and him, so that I could have a relationship with him and one day be in heaven with my Savior. I am thankful for that. The scripture would put it to you this way. In Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2 it says, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. That, is, that was all of us. Our iniquities. Romans 5 8 says, But God showed his love for us that in while we were sinners, Christ died for us while we were sinners, while we were his enemies. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father, but through me. Why? Because it's God that reached out to us first. 1 Timothy chapter 2, actually Acts chapter 4 verse 12 says, And there is salvation in no one else. There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we can be saved. It is Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5 says, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men. That man, Jesus Christ. Christ. First John 2.2, 2, he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. I am thankful today that God reached out to me before I reached out to him. I am thankful he did not leave me in my sins to suffer and die for those sins. I am thankful that he reached out and knew my name before I was born. I am thankful that salvation is not something I earn, not something I do things for to get, but it's a gift from an eternal God that reached out to me first. 
I am thankful that he took my punishment, the punishment I deserved on his cross. I am thankful that God bridged the gap. And the only reason that you would one day be in eternity reaching out to God and not being able to get there to him is because you chose not to reach back now. God has already done everything required for your salvation. All you have to do is reach back to him and in faith accept him as your savior and you will be in his family. You will be a part of the family of God. You shall be saved. It's awesome. So we might reach out for healing from time to time and we're not sure if God's going to do it or not, but we have faith that he will do if he will, right? But at any moment, the sinner can reach out to God and repent of their sins, and he shall be saved. God's not up in heaven trying to determine, well, I'm going to save this one. This one I'm not going to save, even though they ask. He doesn't do it that way. The moment that you turn to God and you say, I'm sorry for my sins, I want you to be my Savior, come into my heart, is the moment that God says yes, a hundred percent of the time, and I am thankful for that. What a blessing. I don't have to worry about if I'm going to heaven or not. I know I am because God did the work to get me there. He bought my ticket. He paid the price. He has me going and praise God he did. And I'm thankful for that this thankful season. Whew. It's good. And out of everything in the world that is going on, that is the one thing you can always be excited about. That is the one thing you can always be thankful for. It is a gift beyond measure. It is something that is absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. And I think sometimes we just have to be reminded of it. And Jesus felt the same way. Isaiah chapter 53 says this. I want you to meditate on these words and remember what he did for you. He was beaten and he was tortured, but he did not say a word. Like a lamb taken to the slaughter, like a sheep being sheared, he took it all in silence. Justice miscarried and he was let off. And did anyone really know what was happening? He died without a thought for his own welfare. Beaten bloody for the sins of my people. They buried him with the wicked, threw him in a grave with the rich men. Even though he had never hurt a soul or said one word that wasn't true. It was for our sins that he did this. That he ripped and tore and crushed him. He did that for our sins. He took the punishment that made us whole. Through his bruises, we get healed. We are all like sheep who have wandered off and gotten lost. We have done our own thing and gone our own way. And God has piled all our sins and everything we've done wrong on him. On him. Luke 16, back to there, says, And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm that has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here you may not be able and then they cross from there to us and he said then I beg you father to send him to my father's house for I have five brothers so that he may warn them lest they also come into this palace of torment this place of torment but Abraham said they have Moses and the prophets let them hear them and he said no father Abraham but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Maybe you are sitting here today and the only reason that you are not saved is because you haven't reached back to Jesus. In fact, I would say, and so would the scripture, that the only reason that you would not be saved today is because you haven't reached out to the one that's already reached out to you. The reason you're not reaching out is because of stubbornness. It's because of pride. 
It might be because you're deceived into thinking something else is true. But whatever the reason is, you need to understand today, without a shadow of a doubt, that God's already reached out to you and he loves you. You just need to reach back. He's there with open arms. He is ready for you. You may be here today, and <laughs> brothers of you this morning, you've been praying and praying and praying and reaching out to God for healing. There's something that you want to be healed of, and you're just praying to God to do that. Maybe it's time, maybe you, I know you've been praying we're going to give you a chance to do that at the altar this morning and just pray for that healing from God here in his house is what I'm trying to say. And you reach out to him. I don't know if he's going to do it or not, but I know he can. And if he doesn't, he's going to give you the strength and the comfort you need to make it through whatever you're struggling with. You may be here today and God has done a miraculous thing in your life and maybe you want to come to the altar and thank him for that personally. Just in his house. Just kneel before him and thank him for that and then go back to your seat. This invitation is for all of those people. If you want to begin a relationship with Jesus, I have more than enough time to talk to you about that. And you can receive him right now, today. So do not delay. So as we stand and sing this hymn of invitation, those are the parameters.